And hello, everybody. It's uh, really a great privilege to have this opportunity. And, uh, and so I'm very grateful to both uh, Patrick and Tiffany for offering the invitation. Can I just get a thumbs up or, or a, uh, someone let me know if uh, you're looking at the right screen? You've got the presentation mode. Yep, cool. Um, okay, so as Patrick said, we're going to take you through a new um, Indigenous Partnerships program at AIMS that we're implementing at AIMS. And uh, we've, talk, moved, we've called this talk Moving from Engagement to Partnerships. So I guess in our past, we tried to do a lot of Indigenous engagement, which was more, more or less telling traditional owners about the science that we were doing. Um, and uh, as one traditional owner put it, um, we've had the engagement, now we're ready for the marriage. So that's really how we've, we've taken it as well. Um, we've also got an incredibly supportive executive and um, governing council at the moment. And uh, we've convinced them that this is a direction that AIMS should be moving in. Uh, so um, Bob Muir and I, um, we're going to jointly present this talk. So we'll be doing a little bit of tag teaming um, in and out. Uh, okay, of course, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of where we're joining the call and where all of you are joining the call, wherever you are in North Queensland or Australia. Um, Bob and I are on Bindle country, um, but of course we are going to be talking about some research on lots of other places around Northern Australia, so I'd like to pay my respects to those traditional owners as well um, and honour their elders past, present and future. And I guess part and parcel of this new approach at AIMS is that we are make, taking steps to really understand um, the connection to country and the continuing culture, knowledge and beliefs that traditional owners have in their country. And, you know, we think we're pretty smart. We've come along, you know, as, a, as scientists, as Western scientists in the last couple of hundred years with some technology and a few qualifications. But really the original marine scientists in Australia were of course the traditional owners and they've got a, a tens of thousands of years of environmental observations and traditional science under their belt. And so what we're trying to do now is um, through collaboration and two-way knowledge sharing, learn from each other and, and move forward together. And that's exactly what we're trying to achieve with the Indigenous Partnerships approach. So I'll just introduce you to the team. Um, myself, Libby, I'm the team leader. Um, Bob here, we refer to Bob as the team elder. Um, so although I'm the team leader, I've been at AIMS for a very long time. I know how to get things done at AIMS. I know how AIMS works, but the cultural leadership for the work that we're doing comes from Bob Muir, um, Manawari Forrester, who may or may not be on the call. She's also an Indigenous Partnerships Coordinator in the team. Um, I'll let um, Bob introduce himself when, when he gets uh, to take over from me, but um, uh, both Manawari and Bob are traditional owners of the Great Barrier Reef from different areas. Um, also Jordan Ivey, who is a um, traditional owner from Northern New South Wales, and he um, has recently completed his Bachelor of Marine Science from Southern Cross Uni, and he's had an interesting sort of alternative pathway to um, a university qualification. And the plus one there, the mystery person is someone that we're just in the process of recruiting and they will commence in January to join the team. And that's a traditional owner from South Australia, um, but somebody who has a background in environmental science and uh, his master's thesis is titled Indigenous Leadership in Climate Change. So we're looking forward to him um, joining our team. So this presentation today, I'm gonna start by taking you through our plan, our Indigenous Partnerships Plan and Policy, and particularly since um, Patrick was telling me that it's something that maybe the centre was, um, was thinking of, of going down this route as well, I thought you may find it interesting to look at the process that we went through to work out what should be in our plan. Um, then I'll hand over to Bob, who will give some example partnership pro projects of this, you know, being put into practice. And then I'll sort of wrap up at the end with a little bit about what we're focusing on next, particularly in the training and capacity building space. Okay, so um, at AIMS, we've actually known for a very long time that we can vastly improve the quality and the impact of the science that we do if we partner with traditional owners. So we've, we have had some great partnership projects going right back to the 1990s. 
But if you look at this map and you look at the, those white lines are our vessel tracks and the yellow boxes with numbers in them are the geo-referenced location of our data sets, you can see that those, those five or so blue dots, which are the location of our partnership projects, it really is the exception rather than the norm. And the big change that's happened in the last few years um, is really because we've been given the mandate from our executive to um, make it the, the um, rather than being the exception, we want this approach um, across the whole portfolio of aims. So that's, a, that's part of our research strategy now, and there are some targets and deliverables that we need to try and meet. So in the, in the development of the AIMS Indigenous Partnerships Plan, it really is a roadmap about how to deliver to that strategic document and meet our targets. So the, the start of the process was to go to IATSIS, the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, and they had published guidelines for ethical research in Indigenous Australian studies. And so, um, and those guidelines were um, reviewed and, and refreshed just last year. And this really gave us some great guiding principles about how to behave and the sorts of outcomes that um, traditional owners might want out of a partnership in marine science. And that that process took us to this document, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, that was it's been adopted by Australia since 2009. And there's an, a whole number of, of um, principles and um, articles in the, the 36 articles altogether, but the one that really resonated with us in the context of the way we govern our own people at AIMS was this one, Article 19, which is about the commitment and that basically the, the right of Indigenous people to be in a position to be granting free prior and informed consent before adopting and implementing legislative or administrative measures that affect them. And I guess that got us to thinking, well, what sort of legislative and administrative measures that we're in, involved in um, that might affect the interests of um, traditional owners? And the answer, of course, is uh, well, there's a whole heap of things, everything that regulates and governs our activities, but we were especially thinking about getting a research permit. So in the context of the Great Barrier Reef, we go to Gurumpa and get a research permit to cover the work that we're doing, but there is nothing in that process of us seeking permission under the regulations that Gurumpa manage um, that re actually requires us to go and um, talk to traditional owners. And we understand that Gabrumpa have their own programs of engagement with traditional owners, but as the, as the researcher, um, there, was, there was nothing there requiring it. And if you're just thinking about the Great Barrier Reef as an example, and the legislative and administrative measures that have, that have an impact on traditional owner rights and interests, there's been a huge improvement through the years from the 70s and 80s when a marine park and a world heritage area was declared with virtually no traditional owner consultation um, through to the present where Gabrumpa have a, an, a um, heritage strategy which is very strong and, and even um, requiring free prior and born consent in some cases. But if the, the map there, the pink bits are the areas of the marine park that have some form of formal indigenous arrangement, such as a Tumra, traditional use of marine resource agreement or an Iliwa or something like that. And it covers about 13% of the marine park. And so that's a great improvement from the 70s. But we know that there are traditional owner interests in 100% of the marine park. So there's still quite a way to go. So then the next thing we did was take steps to try and understand what traditional owners might want out of um, in a partnership in marine science. And besides talking to a lot of traditional owners, particularly within our existing network of projects, we were pointed to the plethora of literature that exists where traditional owners themselves have documented their knowledge needs and their science priorities in their land and sea management plans. And here I've just thrown up some, the cover of about six um, healthy country plans or land and sea management plans. And there are re literally hundreds of these around Northern Australia where individual traditional owners groups at the scale of their sea country have articulated their um, sea management priorities and, and even set targets. Um, that you know we would in by 2025 we would like coral cover to be 
within 10% of what it was in 2010. So there's a lot of these plans have got very, very specific targets. So then we've started to think, well, you know, there's really, we can see lots of synergy there between the sort of research that AIMS likes to do and the sort of research that will deliver to some of these targets that traditional owners themselves have set. And then in addition to that, there are a number of regional photosyntheses. Um, there was one published in 2018 for the Great Barrier Reef um, and the same year for the Northern Territory and there's the Torres Strait Land and Sea Management Strategy. And again, these documents have, are documents that have been largely prepared with the knowledge and the direction of traditional owners. And actually there's a more recent, there's a recent one for Western Australia as well that covers the whole of the state of Western Australia. So to doing a review of these documents and also our own um, consultations, we started to understand a lot more about what traditional owners want out of marine science. Um, the other thing we learned was that country is not just the biophysical environment that we were maybe used to interacting with as Western scientists. We might go and measure the currents or the growth of corals or count the fish or whatever. We look at it, we, well, maybe I'm just talking personally, but the scientists that were involved in this, we're, we're looking at the world in a, through a fairly biophysical lens, whereas for traditional owners, it is much more than that. It's the living, the non-living, the tangible, the intangible. It's even the stories and the song lines and the, um, the mythical beings that were involved in creation. And then we also started to learn a bit about lore, as in L-O-R-E. And uh, so, and we already knew quite a lot about the LAW that governs marine science, getting permits and making sure you've got the right ticket to drive the boat and the right, you know, you've updated your first aid and you've got your ADAS diving certification. We're, we're already used to following LAW. And so what we needed to do with this plan was to bring it together with what we needed to do under LORE. So pretty much we, we, we already knew what we were interested in doing at Ames, um, we put a, we did a review of what traditional owners were telling us that they were interested in doing. And of course, in that area of overlap is where we've built the Indigenous Partnerships Plan and Policy. And it's, a, it's about much more than just the synergies in the science and the knowledge needs and our capacity and capability to do work together. It's also primarily actually about respecting and valuing traditional knowledge and also respecting and embracing that principle of free prior and informed consent and upholding traditional owners' inherent rights and responsibilities for sea country. And uh, another interesting part of the policy, which was adopted by our council in only March this year, is that we will hold our partners and collaborators to the same standard. So that might be something that um, might resonate with some of our colleagues at the Center of Excellence, because it pretty much means that if you're going to collaborate with AIMS, use our facilities, do experiments in CCM or come out on our ships, then we need to also be um, helping you and facilitating the engagement with you in order to meet the standard. And uh, um, so the model for governance of our marine science now in, in the context of traditional owner engagement sits on this tiered system. And we know that the value-based metals construct is not particularly an Indigenous concept, but it's something that everybody understands. So pretty much every single project at Ames needs to be mapped into one of these tiers based on the characteristics of the project. And then once you know what tier your project is, you can then understand very clearly the in engagement, um, traditional owner engagement that is expected to meet the requirements of that tier. So beginning with bronze, bronze projects are researcher led projects and that's the basic entry level of traditional owner engagement where we require researchers to identify who the traditional owners are of the, of the place that you're studying, acknowledge them in all of your outputs. Um, I'm talking about the acknowledgement section of papers and that sl acknowledgement slide that we all have in our um, presentations where we put the logos of this, that and the other and we thank the people who helped with the lab work, et cetera. Um, we, what we now like to see an acknowledgement of whose sea country the work took place on. And we also communicate the results to traditional owners. And the next level up is the, are the silver projects, still traditional owner led, sorry, still researcher led projects. 
Uh, but in addition to everything that we require in bronze, researchers are also required to engage much more deeply with traditional owners in order to obtain or to seek and hopefully obtain free prior and informed consent. And we hope that it, by having those deep relationships and, and, and discussions with traditional owners, that through time we will start to see relationships build between our researchers and traditional owners based on mutual trust and respect and that in and and understanding each other and that from that we will start to see more gold projects emerge and gold projects are genuine partnerships that are co-designed and co-delivered with traditional owners and it's interesting that in our first draft of our plan um, that we sent out for uh, review to to a number of people including traditional owners the feedback from traditional owners was to add the next category the platinum category which are traditional owner initiated and led projects that AIMS may support with some capability or, or, or something that we can do that can be supportive. So that's pretty much it. It's, fairly, it's a fairly simple construct. The idea is that once you understand the engagement that's required, then at the planning phase of your project, you're able to plan appropriate resources and timelines and, and that sort of thing. The other thing I might mention is that projects that have a significant intersection with sea country, that's how we've defined it. And, and that means you're extracting something from sea country, you're doing manipulative experiments, you're interfering with sea country, basically. You're doing anything except taking photos and counting things and getting data from satellites. Um, you have to be silver or above. So if you're going and doing, ex, you know, doing it, that sort of research, you, it's not possible to be bronze. The, the entry point for you will be a silver project. So I mentioned before that we're holding our partners and collaborators to the same standard. So when AIMS became the managing entity for the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program, which is, um, which is a major research undertaking that I'm sure you're all familiar with, and it's although AIMS is running the managing entity, it's actually a multi-institutional partnership. But we then needed to address the issue of traditional owner engagement within Reef Restoration and Adaptation Research the objective of which is to develop safe um, and acceptable interventions to help the reef cope with climate change. So we're absolutely in the territory of significantly intersecting with sea country. So after reviewing other possible Indigenous engagement frameworks, such as those previously implemented with NESP and CSIRO and various others, we came up with pretty much a version, a slight adaptation of the AIMS tiered structure um, where at the desktop projects, there's a large modeling and, and decision, decision support group that are largely dealing with remote data streams. Those projects are bronze projects, but everything else that needs to go to sea and intersect with sea country needs um, the free prior and informed consent. And because, because the research was largely already planned before um, we came along with this in, Indigenous engagement framework, they're pretty much going to be all silver projects because they are researcher led projects, but we do have that free prior informed consent element in them now. Um, so uh, the lots of challenges. I'll just mention a few challenges in implementing this now. So um, when a researcher identifies where they want to work, how do we work out whose sea country it is? And then once we figured that out, what's the governance of that group? So who, how are they arranged? Who's the boss? who has the law authority to grant consent. And so we've developed um, some map layers, um, largely with the publicly available information, such as through the Native Title Tribunal or the Brumpers Tumra maps um, and the Indigenous protected areas. But there are lots of gaps in that. And so we're just so grateful to have traditional owners in our team who can use their personal and family networks to help us fill the gaps so that we can make sure that we're talking to the right people. Um, another challenge, of course, is to ensure that the consent we're seeking and hopefully obtaining is genuinely informed. So that means science communication, unpacking some pretty complex science, particularly in you know, the reef restoration space. Um, we need to allow sufficient time and that is often a challenge when you've got researchers that have already got ship time booked on a research vessel. Um, and there's often very hard deadlines like coral spawning. Um, so we just need to work within that. And, um, and you know, fixing the, or balancing the need for 
being specific when we're asking for consent, but also allowing enough flexibility so that the researchers can do their job. You know, things like, as we all know, the weather, you can't always guarantee the weather. You might need to come up with contingency sites uh, depending on circumstances at the time. So our team does a lot of science communication, meetings with traditional owners, and we bring the researchers along and the, and the Ames researchers have just done an absolutely brilliant job um, sort of adapting their communication style to make the information accessible. Um, we develop fact sheets because we like to leave written material with traditional owners and we're just trying to open up those channels of communication. So pretty much we, um, the, these, uh, this is how we operate within um, our aims and also with our uh, RAP partners. So we've got three lanes here, the researchers, the, our team, and then the actual engagement. So the researchers contact us and let us know where they want to work. And then we've got a set of nine questions that we make them answer so that together we can develop a fact sheet. And we tend to draft the fact sheet um, just to help those researchers um, master the plain English that we need the language to be. Um, we also then will identify the traditional owners and who their contact key contacts are and what their governance structure is. And then we will contact them. And as that we call that first contact, we say that we want to engage. We say we're, the purpose of engaging is to ask for consent, pretty much making them the decision maker about what we can and can't do on their country. And then we give them a fact sheet a week before we finally meet with them. And we may need to have multiple meetings. It just depends. And then eventually we get to the point where there's comfort that the, um, the information's been uh, fully uh, passed over and then they're in a position to make an informed consent decision. Sometimes, most of the time, it's been yes. Sometimes there might be conditions. Um, and then we communicate that back to the researcher and they get started. But sometimes the answer is no. And if the answer is no, we um, respect that and the researcher needs to come up with a contingency plan or um, identify some alternative sites and then we start the process again. So we prepare lots of these fact sheets um, and we also, because of some of these projects might be over a long time horizon, maybe it's a four year, we're asking for approval for a four year project. We don't leave it at that, we need to continually communicate. So traditional owners appreciate being told when there are gonna be people on country. In some cases, there might be this great big research vessel right out the front of us of an indigenous community. So um, we might, the, these one page flyers are designed to go on the notice board at the shop or something similar. But in other cases, the traditional owners may not live on country, but they still want to know who's on country. And of course, we continually um, update them with the results. So this is just a little snapshot of what we've been doing in the last year to support the RAP program and the location of places where we have sought and obtained consent where, it, where the circle is green and, um, and where it's orange, we've either not got consent or we've not got the engagement to the level where there can be an informed consent decision. And with that, I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Bob. Yeah. Thank you. Um... Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the Bengal people and this country I'm speaking at the moment. And, um, yeah. and uh, I suppose uh, I'll talk about our partnerships uh, with the Wapaburra Coal Project. Um, so, yeah, it, it is a very important project uh, as far as Wapaburra and Ames coming together. Uh, it's, and as you can see uh, in the line there, it's about the survival and growth in the first year of baby coal's life, which is pretty important when we're talking about the reef restoration program uh, and, and uh, information and the lessons we can learn from this. So basically in 2019, Wappleborough and Ames, we had a workshop on Canome, uh, North Keppel Island. And as you can see, the, you know, we had a lot of people there, we had uh, the 40 traditional owners, um, 65 participants were on the island for a two for a week. Uh, and we did some uh, cultural mapping uh, for the coal uh, site selections for the project. Also the business of the consent for FPIC, it wasn't just a, um, uh, they actually, uh, Wobblebar actually helped to develop the form with this FPIC as well. Uh, there was a process where some of the Wobblebar said we need more information there about this and that and so, we actually workshopped the FPIC as well before we even sat down and talked about getting their consent. 
Um, there's also, you know, it really is a good solid uh, relationship building. Um, but one of the things we do is also a thing of uh, we call truth telling, and you know, we, we actually get out there and uh, talk about what AIMS has done on their country, for, our country for the last 40 years. Uh, there's also, you know, we've got ideas for future projects. Uh, one of the great things is also there's a two-way learning process that it, it really is something where um, the Wobble Borough and AIMS, we both learn from each other. And then the great example of that was a, a new dance that was produced uh, after, at the workshop. Uh, we sat out and listened to AIMS and the scientists and, uh, and the researchers. And at the end of the day, uh, a senior uh, a, a senior Wobble woman actually uh, produced a dance with our young ones, which I'll show you later. Uh, it's a very significant event uh, talking about two-way learning. And as I said before, the consent process, the free pool and informed consent, uh, we had, you know, video, photos, photography forms as usual, uh, but the, the knowledge sharing consent forms provided on day two, and the, like I said before, the forms were too general, and it was revised to be very specific about AIMS use of the knowledge shared. And so the use of maps and planning for the project, the inclusion of our knowledge in the workshop report. Um, and also, you know, we, we like to have our names there as well, instead of, uh, I know in the past, uh, most reports you get there'd be some comment in there. And you, myself personally, I'd be thinking, oh, that's uncle, he said that. Uh, so it, it's something that also gives us a bit more credibility, I suppose, as well. And, and acknowledgement. So there's also uh, general information that can be shared with the media. We talked about that and aims as far as the uh, internal research, including with other, which we can use with, with other TA groups. And, you know, it was something that, um, it was really a, a first for us in a lot of ways with aims and Waffle Borough coming together like this. And, and the process of the, of consent was really genuine um, and, and you know it's something that uh, both of us really appreciated the elders appreciated it as well um, there, there was also the business where we talked before uh, about we actually had two people decline to provide consent and, and so really for us the business of just no really had to be looked at properly and done in the way and dealt with uh, so we actually had actions or processes when we did come across the no. Instead of just thinking and of, um, thinking primarily of the just getting a yes and all the effort and whatever goes into it, sometimes the no can be a shock if you're not prepared for it. So we really did look into that as well. Uh, and you know, there are genuine reasons why people say no. Sometimes it's sorry business. Sometimes it's just their government structure and how they're trying to get together. And, you know, there was lots of presentations and lots of pros, pros, discussions about the research. And that sort of really was something that was really great uh, in a lot of ways, because not only it brings the researchers together, but one of the things I mentioned as well is that it's the first time a lot of these Wobble Borough people actually were on the island. So, you know, it's something that brought us together. It was a great workshop. We uh, built a great relationship um, now with uh, AIMS to the extent where I'm working with AIMS now as well. Um, but our elders really uh, appreciated the process of uh, the truth telling. And, you know, there was a bit of a shock there when AIMS sits in front of us and tells us that they've been working on our country for 40 to 50 years, but this is the first time we've come to talk to you. Um, it did cause a bit of a uh, problem with a, a bit of, well, I suppose, angst or something like that with our elders. And there were a few heated moments, but I think the researchers uh, just stood, you know, they just listened and very respectfully just listened to what our elders were saying. And in the end, I think that was the, the process that really helped uh, us go forward by not trying to defend our actions, uh, the, the researchers, by actually just taking on board what everyone said and, and doing it in a way that it, it just showed that respect. And it just, I've said it before, but the relationship just really grew from that. And I spoke about the mapping. Um, that was a great exercise. Um, once again, it was really us sort of picking locations and spots, but we also looked at the mainland as well. And 
for a lot of the young people and our people in that region, it was their first time they knew about these things. Because uh, I suppose the other thing that has been mentioned is that, and I said it before, a lot of us haven't been on this country, but no one really lives in this region. They're all from down south, up north, all across the country. And to come together like this and see these things is an education for us as well. And the business of just being on country together, that's, um, we just call it healing. It really helps us. It sort of regenerates us, gives us, recharges our batteries, makes us, you know, when we go back to the mainland, we've got more energy to deal with all these issues that are facing us today. Now, I talked a little bit about the, um, earlier on about the two-way learning and the, the dance. Um, so right now, what I've got here is a, a couple of videos that we're going to show you. And um, basically, Megan, uh, she'll be explaining the dance. And, and what happened is that I'll just try and briefly do it first. But after sitting down listening to the scientists uh, about coal spawning and the project and what was happening, we actually came up with a dance that reflected the stories that we heard that day uh, and turned it into a dance which uh, also reflected our history as well. Uh, the business of the coral spawning, as you know, they sort of drift around and then they look for a place to settle and, and then that, that becomes their home. So it was a similar story for Wapabara people as well. But um, I'll, I'll stop now and uh, play these videos and get back to you soon. And then yarn with yarn. Yarn is what we learn being go. So that's by like yarn being go. So that's the, when we started looking up, meaning we were looking at the full moon because that's the time the spawning happened. So then we came out and we were finding our place. Yamba. Coming in, meaning how come in, we have to feel our place, which is why then our women had a different dance to the men, identifying that there's genders in the coral, being female, male, and both. And then Wapabara saying, Yes, we are home, we know we are Wapabara, we are stationed, and all together in our own style. Yarn meaning go again for new life. Go. Yarn. Oh, oh. <laughs> One. Out of oh, coral. Yeah, no, just keep going. Yeah, there we go. Ah. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah, well, that sort of five minute little video and um, that dance is something that's pretty, pretty powerful. Uh, I know people today still get goosebumps just uh, mentioning it. So it is something that really um, is a powerful thing that come out of that workshop with the two way learning. Um, the other thing we talked did we, we dealt with a, a new program that's been uh, produced and it's called strong program uh, strong people strong country and with that we actually use that while we're on the island to get uh, our Wapabara people involved to basically uh, hear what they think and what their concerns are and their issues about what the future is. Yeah, so okay, so here we go. These are just a few different things we talked about in, in our relationship. And these are things like, you know, learning from our elders, um, education side of things. And it really was something that um, helped us look at this. So once this project's finished, we're going to look at something very similar and then come back and get our people to talk about this again and, and actually see how we've progressed.
And you know, one of the things that we haven't found out is the, one of the questions was, is this, your, is this your first time on country? And as you can see, it really was a major impact for our people. Um, and we did have people from Sydney, um, all the way from Cape York come to it together. So, so it's a simple question, but it really does show how, um, you know, that yes would make a big difference to how we feel. And like I said before, recharge our battery. And here's some comments, you know, how powerful to say in the future that you were the first to come back. We have a living history story. We don't want to be the textbook story. Facebook is our rock baby. Yeah. Interesting to have um, old tradition and Facebook together there. Um, we want to say, we want to go home and say we made a dance when we came here. We didn't know a lot of our dance. With the project, um, there was also a coral aquaculture traineeships. Um, we um, obviously we looked at Wapaburra people first, um, our priority, but we ended up with one Wapaburra lady there working with us and another young fellow, the British owners. Uh, actually were involved in this coal aquaculture traineeships. So it's a 12 month you know, traineeship and um, really it, I think the big thing out of that is the third three in aquaculture is something that we're using but we're adapting it in a way to actually suit what we're doing here and uh, our work. Also there's a third three for in aquaculture for those uh, trainees where after they finish the four year, well it's 12, four years with AIMS, they are actually be uh, able to look at other employment or keep continuing in that field with AIMS. Now here's uh, another project that's happening and this is the Northern Australian Marine Monitoring Alliance. And it really is uh, monitoring, you know, it's part of AIMS core business. And really what we're looking at is uh, the, the, the marrying, I suppose, of the two cultures where AIMS have been in scientists, but the traditional owners really want to do the same thing, monitor our country and understand what's happening and manage our country. So really it's something that's uh, a great sort of program where we're bringing everybody together and the standardised and scientific robust monitoring it basically means that the traditional owners can actually research their own country in the area and then send that up to a cloud and it might be specific to their area but we can then look at the broad area as well. So it's something that, you know, we're it's been developed and we're still working on it. And at the stage, um, we have a few projects happening and there are more in the future. And here, you know, talked about combining Western knowledge and, and a traditional knowledge in a map. That really is an important pro pro process uh, for us because the map, the traditional sort of map process really is, as far as our cultural heritage and things like that is, it seems to be like an icebreaker, I suppose that's one word. It really brings us together and brings people uh, out involved and, and active in the in the workshop, um, and also I think that sense of ownership that's that's my patch or that's that sacred please stay away. And so it really did help us with that mapping. So you know out of that we um, look at the the remote sensing, the multi beam, and all that. But we actually asked where to go and talk to the traditional owners about their interests as well. And here you can see how a map uh, designed the baseline study and monitoring program. And, and my understanding with this map is the Bardi Jowi people sat out first and they actually produced this map that showed all their interest and their knowledge. And then when the scientists came along, it virtually mirrored what the Bardi Jowi people had said. And, you know, so it's something that, you know, it's good to um, use as far as uh, management of country, how you're looking at projects for the future how you can also, you know, record the past issues and, and try and deal with the future again. So here we go. Um, what we're looking at here is uh, different places where they'll place these brubs and they're two different brubs there. You've got um, one set that's sort of really uh, large vessel. You've got to drop it off the side. The other one is a small inland inshore uh, process where as you go along, you just drop the camera down or drop cam, as it says. Um, so I'll try not to explain too much here. I think that's about. I think, it. Yeah, that's that's the that's the the design of the Bardi Jowie monitoring project in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah. And now we've got another video. Another video talking about all of this. Bardi Jowie country is in the top end of Dampier Peninsula. 
And we sold a lot of people. We've got the biggest start in the Southern Hemisphere. I coordinate the Bari Gai Rangers. And this is the country we look after. Nice day. Sure is. Even though we know about our country, even how healthy it is, it is great to get the scientific expertise in to give us hard evidence of how healthy our resources are out there. We're going to do two different types of surveys. One for looking at the coral that's called drop cap. We're also using BRAS, which is a baited underwater station for looking at the fish communities in the coral reefs. And you're doing a good job, too. Working with the uh, researchers. And uh, yeah, we're getting good results. We just want to make sure that we're looking after the country in the best possible way. We came up here about five years ago as part of the WAMSI project. Um, doing some research. We had some questions that we were interested in. And the Bardi Rangers helped us out. Came back with some of the results and we found out that they had some other questions of their own that we might be able to help them with. How healthy are the coral reefs and how healthy are the fish stocks and how they're changing through time. I can see this changes on the reefs. Yeah, right now we're in a place called Punali, my traditional country. It's part of Namogun. It was chosen by us for the um, rock cams. Come yeah. on, Jim. So we've got the camera mounted on a plate here. This is a really nice table service to make a really good focus photo. Lower it up and down. And this Trevor drives along superbly following the GPS track. So we'll do this monitoring every year so that we can see and analyze the data year by year if anything has changed. Fish need to read to stay home as well. Oh, what is that? Look at that. We call that bubbly squid. No barley. All fish will be real important to Barijai people. That's the main food source in our culture. Salan, Barumbad, even Maran and stuff inside the reefs. You find all mangrove jacks come out of the creeks, sit in the reef. So the observation that's been happening for millennia is a scientific form of observation. And we've come in with some technology that's essentially doing a similar thing. We're using our cultural knowledge and the scientific expertise, putting them together and get a better result, better outcome for both. So really the highest level objective of AIMS is to understand the state of environment in the tropical marine systems across Northern Australia. And the only way to really get that understanding is through collaboration with the traditional owners and particularly the rangers. We've been doing this for three years now and we're continuing to, to develop the methods and also the understanding of each other as people. It's telling me that that's 38 metres south. Is it the south? <laughs> <laughs> Straight flash on the back of here because we use the two cameras to get the size of the fish. Just read for the Cameras yeah. give us information on the number, the size, and the kinds of fish. Skippies, mango objects, and we'll get sharks before. Come sliding in. I found a giraffe and I tried to get it as straight as possible so that I can measure it. How big do you think that fish is? 30 centimeters. 30. Okay. 40. 40. Put a dot and then it's going to tell me that it is 32 centimeters. <laughs> the partnership we have with Ames and Wamsi are very important to us. Can you mention what the guys do? We'll continue to monitor it and use the same tools. Yeah, I'm nice, man. This way we can keep an eye on how our country is going, how healthy it is in the future. Hey, we'll be going further now. If we have to do a little bit more to get more accurate, so be it. To get the data for the sizes and weight, that we'll just have to do it. With the rangers working in the backyard. First and foremost, they're saw a lot of people, so they're in their environment, out in the sea. 
one could wish for nothing better, I suppose. There. Um, okay, so it's my turn again now just to, to talk a little bit more about NAMA, the Northern Australian Marine Monitoring Alliance, because although that Bardi Jawi project is very focused on monitoring coral reef, coral cover basically, and fish communities, um, depending on what a traditional owner group is interested in, that it can be the monitoring can cover many, many different things. And some of our other projects, we've got um, ocean observing stations. Um, we've got, you know, deploying various loggers, looking at, at ocean chemistry, if they may have contaminants of concern. So essentially, we've got, we're trying to put together a toolkit of marine monitoring methods suitable for sea rangers to use, scientifically robust data collected, and then um, the, the methods that are actually chosen and in one program can be mixed and matched, matched <laughs> according to the priorities and capacity of the rangers. Um, we've got quite a lot of um, effort also going into the development of new technology for data collection and particularly um, collecting data in images. And in this video here, we're looking at a transom mounted frame, which is, um, has a number of GoPros attached, which, and the GoPros are recording um, a track of land, of uh, sea rather, a reef under the boat, the, the track that the boat is going. Those um, video fields are overlapping, and then we are able to stitch those together and then use artificial intelligence to do some analysis of those images. And so in this here, you can see that track of, um, of, uh, of parallel um, video fields that have been stitched together, and there's a craniform starfish and so you can see then that, um, you know, collecting imagery of this strip through time would absolutely allow the collection of robust information out of the image, um, which does not require a visual assessment by an observer on the day, where we know we get a lot of um, noise in the data due to winter observer variability. So there's a whole group of aims, a whole program at aims dedicated to the development of technology to improve the monitoring that um, and the data that comes out of. Um, now I'm just trying to stop that. Here we go. Um, and there's here's just a little look. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Reef Cloud platform. We also have a team looking at the data science and developing the data platform and workflow, um, cloud based, so uh, that can then result in some very simple dashboard reporting so that the traditional owners have access to the knowledge that they need to manage their country. And this platform also allows individual data custodians to control access to their own data. Um, and another project in progress is to put all of this together in a marine monitoring manual. Um, and here we have the location of our four demonstration projects. So at the moment, we're in a phase where we're trying to consolidate and standardize, but then hopefully in the future, we'll be able to um, roll that out to many, many different traditional owner groups across the North. Another thing we've been involved in is the review of the standard uh, certificate three that indigenous rangers tend to do. And that used to be called conservation and land management. Last year, that package was reviewed and we were invited to provide input, um, which was great. And so it's been refreshed and it's now called a certificate three in conservation and ecosystem management. And it now is, uh, has in pride of place, um, 10 units of competency, which provide a marine specialty. And five of those are built around marine monitoring and, uh, and the other five are taken out of the COPS and training course, things like being able to operate safely on a vessel, small vessel or platform. So we're really pleased now that, that with the training and capacity building that we do in these monitoring partnerships, that there is, it is now possible for a assessor to come along and formally assess the acquisition of those competencies so that they can go towards this accredited qualification. And um, so in, in this way, we're really trying to use our R&D projects where we're having these partnerships as a platform for meaningful training and capacity building. So it's not no longer just about having people come along on your field trip. We're looking at active participation and the development of skills 
that can be formally assessed and count towards an accredited qualification. And in this diagram here, you, we're sort of looking at the, the different levels of, um, of uh, engagement with training and capacity building that ultimately we hope will end up with more Indigenous people employed at AIMS at all levels. So we've got the typical pathway that a lot of people who end up as a research scientist take, which is to go to university, possibly on the basis of your school results, getting you into university, some postgraduate research training, and then you can go on and have a satisfying marine science career. But we know from working a lot with the traditional owners now that that straight to university pathway is not always that accessible and that the vocational training pathways, things like the Certificate 3 in Aquaculture or Certificate 3 in Conservation and Ecosystem Management, might, be, might feel more accessible. But we also know that a, a Certificate 3 can map over to an ATAR score, which might allow transition into university studies down the track. And in fact, we've just now employed our very first full-time Indigenous Training and Capacity Building Coordinator, um, I introduced him to him on an earlier slide, Jordan Ivey is his name. He um, failed high school, then he went and got an apprenticeship as a motor mechanic that gave him a certificate three, and he used that to get into university. And he has now completed the Bachelor of Marine Science and Management at Southern Cross University with flying colors and with all sorts of prestigious scholarships along the way. So. Um, that is the pathway that he took and we're really, really pleased that we've got someone that's got first-hand experience in that sort of a pathway, helping us to create those pathways within our research at AIMS. And I might also say that even within vocational training, we're also developing some micro-credentials. We're finding that meeting the workplace health and safety requirements of being able to go on an AIMS field trip is actually an impediment. It's a barrier to having traditional owners participate. And so we're looking at packaging up the credentials or the competencies that you need, things like first aid, radio operator license, boat license, that sort of thing, um, and packaging that up as a micro credential and identifying ways that it can in the future count towards getting a certificate qualification. So that's what we've been doing. Oh, and I should also say that um, with the signing of the new AIMS at JCU agreement, Hopefully next week, we're hoping to bring a lot of these alternative pathways and some vocational training um, into under the umbrella of the AIMS at JCU Alliance as well. So that's it from us. And I might stop sharing my screen and invite questions if we've still got time for some. Patrick? Uh, 